Well, good evening, Mosaic. How are y'all doing? Good, 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 good. Hey, if you're in the foyer, come on in. We're about to get started. Um, hey, we, we have a, a little change of plans for tonight. Um, midweek this week, I was meeting with Kyle Jackson, our wonderful worship leader, you know, cool artistic guy with the beard. Um, that narrows it down to the entire Mosaic male staff. So um, I was chatting with Kyle, and we are making a plan because his wife is due to have a baby mid-October. And so we were planning for like, who's going to sub in leading worship come like October 14th and 21st. And then we got a text this morning that said, uh, it's go time like now. So if y'all want to say a prayer for Meredith, she's in the hospital right now, Kyle's wife having a baby. So they're doing that. Uh, and then we, we had to make a few changes for worship tonight. Um, and so one of the things that's really great is Miriam was already rehearsed and prepped to lead the service. And she actually knew the service inside and out. And so she's able to carry a lot. And one of the things that in us getting together and rehearsing this afternoon that made me realize is just how much our people that lead on the worship team give to be prepared to come lead us every Saturday night. I don't know if, yeah, you can clap for them. I, I don't know if we appreciate enough. You know, if you think about like, you know, your, your normal touring musicians and those kind of people, they usually will spend a month of rehearsals to learn one set of songs that they will play over and over again for a year. Um, but what our musicians do is weekly, they learn, rehearse, and prep a new set of songs. It's actually a really incredible amount of work that they put in every week to come prepared to lead us with excellence and to, to, to usher us in to sing to Jesus. And it's a really cool thing. And so I'm really grateful uh, for the work that they do, for the work Miriam's done to, to be ready to sing with us tonight. So um, we're excited to sing together. Let me say a quick prayer for Kyle and Meredith and baby Jackson on the way, and then we'll stand and sing. Lord, we love you. We do pray um, for baby Jackson number two, um, that, that tonight will just be a healthy delivery and that you'll be with Kyle and Meredith and Graham and the, the, the new sibling and baby, uh, that you'll just bless that time of joy and be with us tonight. I pray that as we sing uh, to you, our great King, that you will be glorified in all that we do and that we'll be transformed by this time. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Would you stand and sing with us together?
Take a seat. Hey, I want to welcome Miss Melanie Manning. Uh, speaking of pregnant, Melanie, you're pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. Half when are you supposed through. to have your baby? I am having my baby in February. I'm February, there it is. <laughs> hey, guys, Melanie is such an incredible gift to our team. She is the administrator for, for the entire Fellowship Mosaic congregation, and she um, just organizes and communicates and helps everything run really, really well, and she, uh, she knows what's going on around here, and so we want to give her an opportunity to tell us all about it. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. So I am Melanie. If I have not met you, I would love to meet you because all it is, I probably know your name and just don't know your face. Uh, being in our computers all the time, I'm in the database, and it's just really cool when I get to meet someone and be like, oh my goodness, you have five kids. Um, so I really would love to get to know you. So just know that if you are new, if this is your first time, come talk to me. I'm always a friendly face, but we also have an info booth in our foyer full of people who are full of joy and love for the Lord and would love to get to know you. Okay, some announcements for next week is next gen. So next gen service means the next generation of worshipers will come in and worship with us. This actually happens the first Saturday of every month with our middle schoolers. And so our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders come in and they get to worship with us. But this one is super special because we actually bring the next, next generation in and we bring the elementary kids in. And so our first through fifth grade, as well as our sixth through eighth grade, will come in, worship with the adults, and get a feel of what it is to worship with our whole body of, like, believers. So it's really, really cool. So just know if that applies to you because you have munchkins in those areas, they will be in here with you next weekend. Also, we still have the infant through kindergarten area open. So they will still go to service, normal, normal, normal. If you have kids, infant through any age, this next announcement will be super cool because it's Street Fest, which is a really fun way for our like families and community at Mosaic to just hang out together and enjoy the fall like spooky season. But we have like a fall festival, it's a carnival and games and candy. And so we'd love for you to come with your kids or with like your community group regardless if you have kids, and just come and hang out. When you come, we'd love for you to bring a canned good or a pantry item as an entry fee. But it's a really fun area to just like come and hang out and just really get to be with other believers. So those are all my two announcements, quick and short. So if um, you will pray this next thing with me, I'd like for you to stand. Um, we're gonna be doing our offering prayer. And this is something that it's so easy for us to do every single week and just forget that it's a prayer that it's something that we get to say to our Lord and our Savior, and we get to say it with our hearts. So just please um, say it in your mind or uh, say it out loud with me. That would just be um, welcome. So our time together to say the offering prayer. Oh, Father, giver of all, every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask you to accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May they bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. As you multiplied the offering of fish and loaves, multiply these to accomplish more than we can ask or imagine. We give freely and not under compulsion, for all we have is yours, Lord. Nothing we can give could match your great gifts to us, your Son and your Spirit. Amen. You know, I... I did this worship leading thing for uh, for probably 10 years all the time. And then uh, I shifted roles and I quit doing it very, very often. And I noticed something really odd start to happen. 
um, when I was sitting in those chairs, I didn't know how to worship anymore. I, I did not know how to engage in singing together um, without having a guitar in my hand. And it, it took me a while of trying to like reflect and understand like what was going on that when I was in this spot, um, it felt so natural. And then when I wasn't, it was so hard. And, and I've spent a while thinking about that and trying to pray and understand what's happening in me. And I started thinking about the nature of praise. Like what happens when we praise and worship? To praise is to gather together and to talk well of someone, to say this is what's great about this person. And we don't do that a lot in our culture. Like I've started to think like, when do we do praise together? And I could only think of two times that in, in my life that we normally praise outside of church. The one example I could think of was at rehearsal dinners before weddings. Y'all know this experience where we go around and give the toast and say, what's great about this person? And the other time I remember doing this is at retirement parties. Y'all know this one also, like where you take turns talking about how great this person has been. And, uh, and I started thinking about the experience of those. And sometimes gratitude for someone just wells up within you. Um, and it takes you by surprise and you're just moved by the emotion of, of your appreciation. And I suppose that some people might come into this room tonight already just, over, just overflowing with gratitude to God and ready to sing about how great he is. Um, most Saturday nights, I don't walk in already in that state of mind. But when I think of experiences like those other ones, I think particularly of a retirement party for someone who meant a lot to me and mentored me. And I thought about what I wanted to say about him. And as I thought about what I was going to say, gratitude started welling up within me. When I took the time to think about what was so important about him and how I would express it, I started feeling the emotion of gratitude, appreciation, and awe. And I think one of the things that shifted when I quit planning worship services and sitting out there was I was used to spending weeks thinking about these lyrics, weeks thinking about these songs and how they fit together, and it was like I came in just totally prepped with the excitement to sing. And I'm like, the journey from my head to my heart is about 100 miles. And so oftentimes when I sit in this room, these lyrics will flow by. I'll catch one lyric I think is interesting and I want to chew on and think about. And next thing I know, it's three songs later and I've missed the entire worship set. And I just don't have time to reflect on what I'm saying and to let it sink in. So what I want to do is I want to just take a moment, even with the first verse of this song we're about to sing, just in quiet to let us read these lyrics and to reflect on what we're saying and prepare ourselves to sing them to the Lord.
trust him because he will lead us. We don't want to move forward without him. Let's sing that together. We won't move without you. We won't move without you. You're the light of all and all that we need, God. We won't move without you. We won't move without you. You're the light of all. Our sins, they were many, His mercy. 
gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep
Stay standing as we um, speak the word over you. I'm Miriam, by the way. Hi. <laughs> um, and well, I'm Josh. I'm married to this awesome lady. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, yes, we are Miriam and Josh. We're looking at our notes, and they're bright pink in this Bible here. Um, we have been at Mosaic for about four years now since we moved here to Northwest Arkansas again. Um, we have two wonderful babies in heaven and two wonderful babies in the children's ministry here. Two wonderful girls. Yeah. That's our family. Yeah. And uh, speaking of kids' ministry, not only does Miriam get to help serve out up here in worship team, but she also helps serve some of your awesome preschoolers back there. And I get the pleasure of um, teaching elementary here at Mosaic as well and love that. And we get a chance to co-lead an incredible group. Uh, with uh, the Natesels and uh, just, uh, yeah, love, love um, our church family here. Okay. Now hear the word, uh, hear from the word of the Lord from Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Hi, Fellowship Mosaic. It's really good to see you guys. You know, if you haven't picked up on it around here, we don't take ourselves very seriously. Uh, we take what we do very seriously, but we love uh, to laugh and uh, have a pretty good time together. Hey, I wanted to take just a moment before we jump into uh, to Philippians and let you know, uh, I serve on the training center team here at uh, Fellowship. And one of the questions we often get is, hey, what's the training center? Um, is that like where pastors go when they're on like probation or something, you know? Like, what did, did you screw up and so they like put you over on the training center team until you kind of like work the kinks out and AAA ball and then like we might let you back in? Um, I mean, that could be it. But what's been explained to me um, is the training center does three things. So I'm gonna give you three words. Hopefully you can remember these and you can help share the word. Uh, around fellowship and beyond because we love to serve leaders just like you. The training center does three things. We train, we multiply, and we collaborate. And, and the reason this is so kind of compelling and exciting to me is that the training center actually serves all five congregations here uh, at fellowship as well as strategic partners here in Northwest Arkansas across the globe, really. But each time we engage with leaders, we're doing it through the lens of how can we train and sharpen leaders so that they can be more effective with the things that God has entrusted to their care. 
And so you'll see things around here promoted like the panorama of the Bible class or what we refer to as core training. In fact, one of those classes is going on right now that Colin is teaching over in the family center. He's teaching uh, panorama of the Bible tonight. And the focus or the purpose of that course is to equip people to understand sort of the big picture of God's story in Scripture, a panorama view of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so that that as a church we can be self-feeders from God's Word, but also so that we can be better equipped to teach God's Word in our cell groups and in any platform that God's entrusted to your care. But in addition to that, The the training center also serves each congregation at fellowship, developing a clear line of sight on what does the next expression of multiplication look like. And so we work with teams within fellowship, helping teams develop tracks and, and strategies for how they will develop leaders within their sphere of influence, but then even on a congregational level to help Fellowship Mosaic begin to dream about what would be the next expression of church multiplication or church planting that could come out of each congregation at fellowship. And then thirdly, the training center, we collaborate. We we collaborate with leaders and congregations here at fellowship, but also with partner churches all across uh, Northwest Arkansas. And the lead question of the training center, particularly in the area of collaboration, is not we're here to fix you or we're here to make your life better. We've got all the answers But rather, the lead question for the training center is always, how can we help? And it was so neat to me, even a a few months ago, to get a phone call from one of our leaders here at Fellowship, James Gibson, leads on the worship team, realtor here in town. And he said, hey, Will, I had a couple that I helped them buy a house this week, and they've moved here from South Africa They want to be church planters. They want to plant a church to reach internationals. And I'm not real sure, but I think the training center like does stuff with people like that. And I'm like, we do, James. That falls under the categories of train, multiply, collaborate. And it was so cool for him to make that connection and for us over the last couple months to have time to spend time with a couple, uh, Matt and Savannah Mackey, who have moved here from South Africa to plant a church to reach internationals with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's just another expression of how the the training center in so many ways remains hidden in some ways, but consistently serves the body here at Fellowship and also strategic partners across Northwest Arkansas. And it's such a privilege to do that. It feels like a gift. I also wanted to let you know, just in case you're sort of new, My wife and I, Sarah, we've been a part of Mosaic for the last uh, four years, and uh, this is our home congregation. We've we've got three daughters, and we actually have a son uh, on the way, due at the end of January, first part of February, and so we welcome some prayer coverage uh, over that. I I share that with you for a couple reasons, to invite you to pray for us, but also just so that you can, maybe we'll remove sort of that awkward conversation, Sarah, you know, at 20 weeks pregnant, is at that stage where you're like, I feel like something's going on with her, but I I can't ask. So I'll just go ahead and tell you, she is pregnant. In in fact, yeah. In fact, a couple weeks ago, this really felt like a trap. Sarah was about to lead worship up here and uh, was getting dressed and said, hey, Will, do I look pregnant? And I did not know the right answer in that moment. It's like, I don't know if you want me to say, yes, you do, or no, you don't. And I don't know if I should say, I, it was just like, babe, you are pregnant, was the answer. So there you go. Hey, as we jump into Philippians tonight, I want you to recall a time where you recently experienced sort of that, that, that point of no return or, or that point of like, there is no turning back now. It could have been maybe the the sensation of like, uh, you know, climbing up the steep ascent of a roller coaster and that, that kink, 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 that moment of, I probably shouldn't have gotten on this ride, but there's no turning back at that point. Or or sort of the, 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 the power that comes from a really powerful river 
where maybe if you've whitewater rafted or canoed or kayaked before, that moment where you push off from the bank and you feel the boat just literally getting sucked along by the current, that in that moment, you are riding that river whether you want to or not. There's no going back to the bank behind you. Or maybe it was even uh, that, that feeling of, a mixture of excitement and also fear and and sort of like, I really don't even understand what I'm signing. When you're signing a mortgage for the first time at a closing table, or or maybe it was even standing on the marriage altar of going, "There's, there's sort of, this is exciting, but there's kind of a gravity to this moment. It's as if something significant is about to happen and I better pay attention. And I believe when we come to chapter 2 in the letter to the Philippians, I think Paul is in that moment. If you recall last week, there was a major conclusion and proclamation that Paul has made in Philippians 1 verse 21. The proclamation that Paul makes is, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, there's a lot of things in life that come into focus when a person reaches this conclusion. A leader that's as settled as the Apostle Paul is here suddenly starts to see all of life differently. In fact, if Christ is literally everything, to live is Jesus Christ It changes the way you view people, finances, setbacks, family, health, everything. And the thought that we looked at last week is that sort of on the other side of that proclamation, to live is Christ, to die is gain, Mickey unpacked this reality for us that a fully devoted follower of Christ, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, is an unstoppable force. And I think that's where the Apostle Paul was and was calling these early Christians there in Philippi to reach the same conclusions, to reach that same level of being settled. And so when we come to chapter two, as we are tonight, and the chapter opens with the words, therefore, these, this word is, is to... Take us back to the reality that to live is Christ. It's almost as if there's a transition in the letter where now Paul is saying, in light of the fact that to live is Christ, to die is gain, now we move forward with some further decisions. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to take a look at the first 11 verses. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if any of you, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In these opening verses of chapter two, we see four if statements and four then statements. And to be clear, as we see these statements, the the if is not Paul wavering with some level of uncertainty here. It's not like, well, if, you, if by chance you've had any encouragement in Christ. No, actually what Paul's doing here, there's an implied confidence or certainty in the language that Paul is using here. In fact, you, you almost could, could translate this as if Paul is saying, since you've experienced encouragement from being united with Christ, since you have experienced the comfort from his love. What he's really doing in that original audience there in Philippi as they're reading these words of the Apostle Paul, he's inviting them to recount or remember what Jesus has done in and through his body there in Philippi. 
In fact, these first four verses would almost make one of the most beautiful community groups this week. To just simply as a community group, read these four verses and then ask the questions that actually just sort of almost beg to come out of these four verses. This idea of how have you experienced the encouragement of Christ? And to just read the passage slowly and go around the table and just hear some of the stories of recently. How have you experienced the encouragement of Jesus Christ in your life? I know for me, even studying this passage the last few weeks, the first thing that came to my mind in a very tangible way, the way that I've experienced the encouragement of Jesus Christ the last few weeks, I think it was probably three or four weeks ago, Sarah had COVID, was ill for a few days, in bed, fever, three girls, school schedules, work schedules. I mean, things were getting pretty frazzled in the Blanchard household, especially since I don't know how to cook. Um, and it was so, uh, it, was, it was truly touching to be on the receiving end of ministry, to have friends here at Mosaic that we didn't even ask, we didn't put out the word like, oh, please help. Just a couple people here at Mosaic got word that Sarah was sick and they know my inability to prepare food. <laughs> and meals literally showed up on our front porch. One leader brought a meal to my office in a cooler with foil on the top of it with extremely clear instructions. <laughs> I didn't know if I should have been insulted or just amazed at their level of of you know, emotional intelligence. Because, they, yeah, they read the room, you know, turn the oven on, set it to 350, put this pan in, take the saran wrap off first. You know, it was like, okay. But it fed our family. It was, it was a tangible expression of the encouragement of Jesus Christ. How have you experienced, as you work your way through these verses, how have you experienced the unity of Christ? The unity of Christ. A body of believers, a group of churches uniting together. No one attempting to get the glory except wanting to give all the glory and the focus to Jesus. You know, literally this past week, I was down in Houston with a group of churches there, a network called the Houston Church Planning Network, a beautiful expression of the unity of the body of Christ. 15 years ago, a church there in Houston, Clear Creek Community Church, very similar in many ways in terms of DNA and size as fellowship, reached the conclusion that they were not gonna reach the city of Houston alone. <laughs> Eight million people and began to dream, what would it look like to unite with other churches in the Houston area to develop and equip and to launch church planters that could reach people we're not reaching. Fast forward 15 years later, 150 churches there in the Houston area across denominational lines banding together to plant churches to reach unreached people in Houston. And I got to sit in on one of their monthly worship services where these pastors from across the city praised the name of Jesus and encouraged each other and championed one another on and dreamed about the future church plants that they collectively would launch together. It's a tangible expression of the unity of Christ. But as you work your way through that passage, how have you experienced the comfort and the love of Christ? How have you experienced the tenderness and the compassion of Christ. You see, Paul, he's writing with, with, there's an implied certainty here that he's writing to believers that he knows if you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, you have experienced these things. You see, it's truly the humility of Jesus Christ that begins to produce the unity in the local church. You see, unity in the local church is not something to be achieved through a one-time decision. Imagine here in the letter if, if Paul, rather than, than focusing on the humility 
of Christ and the unity that he produces in his body. Imagine if Paul had had started out by sort of circling everyone up in the locker room and said, if we want to win, we've got to be unified. It would have a very different tone when the reality is that unity, unity in the local church is achieved when we begin to imitate the humility of Jesus Christ. And I believe Paul here is is just sort of stirring up that spirit within the body of believers there to focus on what Christ has done in their midst. The example that he has been to them and the humility as they imitate the humility of Christ, the unity that Christ is able to produce. As we continue on in verse five, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I want us to pause for just a moment and and just allow sort of the weight of that verse to flood our lives. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Can you imagine how marriages, parent-children relationships, friendships, co-workers, small groups would be transformed if we were in pursuit of obeying this simple instruction in verse five. Have the same mindset it's Christ Jesus. You know, I think here, Paul, and he's, he's then going to launch into it a very detailed description of what that looks like. He's calling the believers there in Philippi towards a lifetime of pursuing and obeying Jesus Christ. And he's calling them to the transformation that Christ is able to have in our lives when we seek to have the mindset of Jesus in every set of circumstance. When we approach our families and our church and our places of work or play with the idea of, Lord, I want my mind, I want the way that I view people, my body language towards them, the way that I treat people, the way that I think about them, I want to have the mindset of Jesus Christ. Just imagine the transformation that can happen in a person's life, in a community, if we live that way. But then Paul is going to launch in to a detailed description of what the mindset of Jesus Christ looks like that really serves as a model for our relationships. Let's take a look at that in verse 6 through 8. Who, being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. These few verses in Philippians are literally the linchpin of this entire letter. In in fact, some would argue that this is a linchpin or a pillar of the entire Christian faith because theologically what Paul's gonna do here in in just verses six through eight is he's gonna set up one of the most clearest proclamations of who Jesus Christ was and is. And it's this, this powerful intersection that is is truly a mystery and this powerful reality that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. It's it's one of the the most developed portions of, of a Christology that we have in the New Testament. And all of the Christian faith truly hinges around this reality that Jesus was fully God and fully man. His full deity, as we see in in verse 6, 
is not something that Jesus Christ gave up or lay it aside when he became a man. But we also see that he emptied himself. And we have these key phrases as we work our way through these verses that that really require us to go back and unpack together. What you see in verse 6 also that, that Jesus, he voluntarily chose to become a man. He he voluntarily chose to lay aside his rights as the son of God rather than grasping and seizing at his rights. And we even have a, a, a powerful contrast between Adam and Eve in the early parts of scripture, in the first few chapters of Genesis, where we see that Adam considered equality with God something to seize for himself. And yet in Jesus' example, we see in verse 7 that he made himself nothing. The language there is he emptied himself. But he did not lay aside his deity. But rather he set aside his rights and willingly took on the rights of a bondservant. In fact, one of the, the arguments that, that Paul is, is building here and sort of the theological point that he's, he's making for us is, is, is rather than an exchange language of, oh, well, does that mean that, that Jesus like left his deity up in heaven and, and became a man? No, he remained fully God. But what's described here is the addition of his humanity. Remaining fully deity the Son of God, while taking on humanity. One of the examples and a commentator that is often so helpful to many of the teaching pastors here at Fellowship is a former DTS professor by the name of Tom Constable. And he has all of his Bible commentaries online for free. Anybody can access them. And sometimes it's just so helpful in a passage like this that literally people have written volumes of works on. Some people have literally devoted almost their entire scholarly life to unpacking this passage of Scripture. It's so helpful uh, to sort of be able to stand on the shoulders of someone who studied that passage in such depth. But one of the analogies that Constable gives in understanding this, this language describing Jesus is the example of this is a couple years old, but of Shaquille O'Neal. If he were playing basketball with a five-year-old. And it's that idea that if a guy like Shaq were playing basketball with a five-year-old, he doesn't suddenly leave his NBA ability to play basketball at the door and lower himself in terms of ability to play basketball with a five-year-old. He's still an NBA player, and yet he would check certain rights and privileges at the door in order to play basketball with a five-year-old. And it's this idea that, that Jesus, as an expression of humility, was willing to remain fully God, but take on human likeness to come to this earth to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, And as this section ends, is even willing to die death on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin and mistake. And this passage, as we see the humility of Jesus, it ought to remind us that in order to love others, we have first got to empty ourselves in a similar way and live lives that are no longer completely self-absorbed. You see, it's the humility of Jesus that serves as a model for our relationships. And even as we read this, we may think that this is sort of countercultural now to the way that that many people live or even the way that, that we often find ourselves living. But I want us to consider the mindset of the ancient world in which Paul would have written these words just to see how countercultural they truly would have been. Take a look at the words of Michelle Lee Barnwall from Talbot. The concept that all people are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights comes from the Enlightenment 
and would have been thoroughly alien to the ancient world. The predominant belief instead was that people were by nature created unequal as evidence physically, males as dominant and females as inferior. Socially, parents would be superior to children, freeborn superior to slaves, and ethnically, Greeks versus barbarians. Furthermore, the social status was apportioned by nature or God. So in this sense, it was permanent and unchangeable. You know, we think that these words of, of humility uh, are countercultural today. They would have been completely foreign in the ancient world. And it was in that culture that, that Jesus himself even gave the instructions in Luke 22, verses 25 through 27, as he's talking to his disciples, as they have an argument about who's going to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table but I am among you as one who serves. Just consider for a moment how radical this example or model of humility must have been. And consider again the words in Philippians 2.5 that as followers of Jesus in our relationships with one another, we are to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And so in this passage, we see clear evidence that the humility of Jesus Christ, it produces a unity in the church. It gives us a model or a target for relationships, but it also gives us a picture of the future. Take a look at God's response to Jesus. Therefore, in verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, what Paul is setting up here is this, this argument this theological construct of the example and the humility of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, in, in light of the fact that to live is Christ and to die is gain, Paul is reminding the believers in Philippi that the future is secure in Christ, that one day God will make all things right and all of creation Everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will one day proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. It's as if Paul here is launching in almost to like a, a, a mini worship service. That as a man sitting there under house arrest, willing to one day sacrifice his one and only life for the cause of of the gospel is being reminded of the humility and the example of Jesus Christ and the fact that it truly does provide unity for the church and a model for relationships, but it also sets up the hope for the future. And we see in the first part of chapter two here that it's actually the humility of Christ that propels the church to live on mission with him. It's not power and prestige. It's not our ability to, to manipulate and to control and to impress and to, to overtake things. But rather, it literally is the humility of Christ that propels the church to live on mission with him. It was the humility of Christ that caused a man, Paul, in prison to be able to rejoice it was the humility of Christ that would fuel the church in Philippi towards unity and to experience authentic joy. 
And it's the humility of Christ today that continues to propel us, Fellowship Mosaic, to live and love like Jesus across Northwest Arkansas and beyond. Mosaic, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you continue to teach us in the book of Philippians. We thank you so much for the example of the Apostle Paul, how he had an encounter with you that changed his life forever. Lord, I thank you for uh, men like Paul who then went on to uh, proclaim your goodness and grace to people across the ancient world and was able to see churches planted. God, I thank you for his obedience, being willing to serve there in prison, writing letters back to churches that he helped plant, encouraging them and spurring them on to stay focused on you. But God, we realize that all is possible because of the example and the humility of Jesus Christ, who we worship and celebrate and commit our lives to tonight. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Jesus, as, uh, as Paul called us to do in the letter to the Philippians. We see that he had every right to hold on to everything. He, he was equal to God, but he chose not to hold on. He, he let go for our good. How much more then does God call us to let go of the things that we're clinging to for our own advantage? So let's take a moment just to be still and quiet with the Lord and ask the question, what, what might I be clinging to for my own advantage, my own selfish ambition and pride that for the glory of God and the love of others needs to be released? Just take a moment and, and ask the Lord that question in prayer.
Amen. For your glory, Lord, and for the joy of your people, we offer these praises to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Fellowship Mosaic, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And the people said, thanks be to God.